Cram's Farm, up at the top end of Clary Hall Dam, is a beautiful place for some peace and quiet, especially on days like we've been having. If you get there midweek when no one else is around, the silence there is almost complete. Just the calls of bellbirds and currawongs, ducks landing on the water, a distant helicopter poking around looking for marijuana crops. I like the shady spot under the conifers that's right next to the water. Your eyes can rest on the green of the grass and out to the blue of the sky and Wollumbin reflected in the water of the dam. If you have the scent of freshly mown grass, uh, your body and soul goes, ah, this is good. And we've got a hot drink in the thermos and some eclairs from Hanrahan's Bakery in Mwollumba. You can't get much better than that. Times like that, in places like that, refresh our minds, our bodies, our souls. We can get some quiet and some rest in this busy, distracting and distracted world. It's an oasis. I found that there are many passages in the Bible that do the same thing. You read them and your soul says, ah. Psalm 23, with its images of green pastures and quiet waters, speaking of the perfect care of our Heavenly Father, our Good Shepherd. And Philippians 4, verses 4 to 7, does that for me too. Let's read it again. And hear the peace and rest that it speaks about. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. As we've been going through this beautiful letter, we've seen joy permeate everything Paul has written. Chapter 1, Paul could express joy in living, even in trying circumstances. When Jesus becomes the reason for our existence and the centre of our satisfaction, contentment replaces anxiety and we're free to live in joy. In chapter 2, when we grasp what Jesus has done for us, it liberates us for joyful service. Service that takes delight in looking to meet other people's needs. Last week we saw in chapter 3 the joy of sharing. When we share with each other what God has done for us, our present passion to know Jesus, and our hope fixed on heaven, we encourage one another to resist reducing our faith to a performance. Instead, we'll protect and enjoy our relationship with God. And so in each one, we've noticed that it's when we deliberately focus our attention, our love, our hope on Jesus, then we are set free to find joy in our lives. In Luke chapter 4, when Jesus preached his first sermon, he used Isaiah 61 as his text. In it, he was saying that he has come to bring freedom for the captives. And by that, he meant that he was bringing an end to the exile. That time when Israel was banished from their land by God and experienced a bitter captivity to foreign rulers. And even though they had returned to the land of Judah, the exile wasn't really over. They were still dominated by the nations and they were still far from God. In Jesus, God is drawing near again. Later in Jesus' ministry, he announced that he had come to bring an abundance of life. For us today, when we put our trust in Jesus as our Saviour and Lord, we are set free from our captivity. Captivity to our own selfish and destructive desires. And with that freedom, Jesus brings us into an abundance of life. A life that really is unburdened by worry about the future because he has it all in his hands. A life free to look out for the needs of others instead of being a slave to selfishness. A life with a passionate purpose now, to know God and to enjoy Him. And now in this chapter, it's a life to find the joy of true rest and peace. But again, as we've seen all the way through this letter, it takes a deliberate intention of our minds and hearts to pursue that rest. We read in Psalm 62 verse 5, Yes, my soul, find rest in God. My hope comes from Him. Sometimes we need to talk to ourselves and remind ourselves of what God has done for us. I'm pretty sure I've mentioned before a band that I love listening to. They're one of the great African-American gospel groups, the Blind Boys of Alabama. They started singing together in a boys' uh, school for the blind back in the 1930s. 
Now, with some lineup changes over the years, they're still going. Their current lead singer, Jimmy Carter, is 87, and boy, can he still sing. In one of their songs, they sing the line, I've got a made-up mind. And I like that turn of phrase. When it comes to following my Lord Jesus, I've got a made-up mind. I've decided to follow Jesus, and there's no turning back. My mind is set on Him. My deliberate decision is to follow Him, to trust Him, to find my rest in Him. So as Paul goes through chapter 4, that's, that's what he's thinking about. A deliberate set of our heart to uh, know the Lord Jesus. And so do you want to know this joy of rest, real rest and peace? Do you want to have a soul at peace throughout life? Well, it takes a made-up mind. We need to remember what we've been promised and to take hold of them. So we've got a made-up mind in this chapter to do three things. Firstly, it's to turn worry to prayer. We see that in verses 2 to 7. But verses 2 and 3 show us that Paul isn't merely offering tried advice from someone disconnected from the real world. We need to remember that Paul is writing this from prison. And so the things that he's speaking of are things that he has to wrestle with himself. And he also knows the situation in Philippi. And so in this letter of joy, there's only one discordant note, and we read it here, a lack of harmony between two of the women in the church. Now, while it might seem awful that their disagreement has been preserved for us to read about it all these years later, Paul says something much more significant about them. He calls them his co-workers. Now, Paul reserves that title for only a few of his most trusted and respected friends and leaders. Clement, Epaphroditus, Timothy, Titus, Euodia, and Syntyche. They're the ones that he calls co-workers throughout his letters. So the same respect that was shown for Timothy and Epaphroditus earlier in the letter is the respect due to these women. When Paul and his companions first arrived in Philippi, they met a group of women having a prayer meeting by the river. And from that uh, encounter, the church was born. Perhaps Euodia and Syntyche were there from the very beginning. And since that time, they've worked alongside Paul in growing churches and spreading the gospel. They are well-respected leaders. And now, they're disagreeing over something. That's not the first or last time mature Christians will have strong disagreements. Uh, we see that throughout the Bible, in church history, in our churches today. Paul and Barnabas, Peter and Paul, both had their, all had their moments. And so after years of working well together, something relatively minor has got between these two godly women leaders. And it doesn't seem to be a case of one's right and one's wrong. Paul pleads equally with each to agree. He doesn't take sides. Our current culture seems to take delight in escalating disagreements into the stratosphere and then wanting to nuke the other side out of existence. And that gets particularly ugly when it seeks into churches. And we tend to wrap our opinions or our personal convictions in theological wrapping, so every issue is fundamental to the gospel, and those who disagree might not even be Christians, or certainly don't take the Bible as seriously as we do. We add layer and layer upon our disagreements and uh, our own opinions. You know, it's really very rare that any of our disagreements as Christians are that critical that they're fundamental to the gospel. It's a matter of heresy. And yet we still choose them as hills to die on or kill over. Sometimes we can get caught up in disagreements and while we're in them, they consume our thoughts and our sleep and we stress. We're losing the joy of being uh, one of some of God's people because we're caught up in these disagreements that suddenly seem so important and so awful. So Paul says to him in verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. And I'll say it again, rejoice. In other words, he's saying, do you get it by now? When you have a made-up mind that you'll rejoice, that you'll focus on these good and beautiful things, that you're centered on Jesus... Remember what I've said all through this letter? Once you've got that sorted out, once you have re reclaimed the focus on the Lord Jesus, everything else is going to fall into place. 
So the implication is that Yodia and Syndicate need to have this made up mind on what's important. Get back to the, the things that unite them. They work together in the gospel already. The gospel itself. And then this issue, whatever it is that's causing them grief, will be put in its proper perspective. Paul said you can agree on it. So how do you, but how do you do that? How do you uh, reclaim that uh, that center again and uh, and be focused back on the Lord Jesus when things are feeling really stressful? Well, we have a made up mind then to turn our worries into prayer. So he says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. You know, look for things to be thankful for, even as you bring your request to God. You know, Paul's already addressed that joy stealer worry back in chapter 1, so I won't spend too much time on it now. But enough to say that worry is taking our focus off God and staring at our problems instead. They become the big thing, not God. The act of prayer turns that around again. Our focus falls off our worries because we're presenting them back to God and we're asking Him to deal with them. And we can leave them there with Him without any strings attached. We can just we can let go. We want to worry our worries and keep uh, keep going over them in our minds. But we give them to him because he's able and willing to deal with them. And when that happens, says Paul in verse 7, we will know the peace that God alone can give. So is something gnawing away at you? Does the clock beside your bed keep turning over while your mind keeps churning over things in the dark? Has something got between you and a friend? God says, have a made up mind to turn those worries over to him and to leave them there. Leave them there. And when we do that, we will enjoy a rest and that peace that God gives. Even rest at night, true peace. The second thing Paul says that we're to have a made-up mind about is to be able to think on good things, verses 8 and 9. You know, our life is too short and our minds are too precious to waste thinking on anything less than excellent. Because what we take in and dwell on ultimately shapes our attitudes and actions. When I was at uni studying psychology, we learned that people generally believe that our society is far more dangerous than it actually is. That attitude comes from a diet of TV news and social media and doom scrolling on Reddit. You know, if all the information that we received about the world comes through our social media, you know, we wouldn't want to walk out the front door. What we take in shapes our attitudes. I can remember when I was 14, I went to see my first horror movie at the movies. I should not have done that. That experience crippled me for years. I was terrified of nighttime and of the full moon. Even on stinking hot nights, I had to be covered in bed. I struggled with that literally for years. Now, your experience might not be as extreme as mine, but have you got to the end of a movie or TV show and thought, no, I really did not need to watch that? Or you've persevered with a book and when you got to the end of it, you just felt deadened or cheapened. Or when you're with people whose conversation is negative and gossip and whinging, you come away feeling that life's been sucked out of you. you know, maybe that was your odyssey and Syntyche's problem. You know, they'd gotten off track and they'd been dwelling on the negative. So they'd uh, sort of got annoyed by one another or something had come up and that becomes the focus on everything. And it colours everything. And it just uh, twists our friendships. But there's real deep common sense in what Paul is saying, isn't it? If you've got a made-up mind to think on good things... That's going to shape your outlook. Now, Paul's not urging us to bury our heads in happy sand and be naive about people. But perhaps, if anything, today we are too cynical, too quick to find fault. Remember how he said that we bring our requests to God with thanksgiving? And we need to have our eyes looking for the things that are good and worth giving thanks for. I've just mentioned one movie that had a strong impact on my life. There was another movie that I watched years ago that had an even greater effect. And that movie is The Elephant Man. It's, it's my favourite movie that I've only been able to watch once. 
It's a true story about John Merrick, a man who was terribly disfigured by elephantitis. I bawled all the way through it uh, when I was a teenager, but uh, it's such a great movie because it displayed a man's dignity and humanity even in the face of terrible degradation and his experience of the worst of humanity. He was treated like a carnival freak and, and a, a medical um, curiosity. He was considered barely human. He, he just copped so much abuse from even people who claimed to be his friends. But through it all, he was noble, lovely, admirable, praiseworthy. I came away strongly affected by his nobility. It had a deep impact on the way that I viewed people and it had challenged many of my prejudices. And when we choose to think on excellent things, as Paul says in verse 9, and then put them into practice, our lives will be powerfully shaped in the positive. The final thing that we have our made up mind about is to be content about our money. That's in verses 10 to 20. Now, I've said that this is a letter of joy, but the reason why it was written, in part, was to say thank you to the Philippian Christians for their financial support. Paul, the missionary, although currently in prison, is writing to one of his supporting churches and saying thank you. But even in that, we see some principles that help us to have a healthy approach to money and possessions. Because sometimes when we fix on, fixate ourselves on what we lack and all the things that need to be done, we drop down into worry again. So firstly, he tells us that he's content in whatever situation God's placed him in. Notice the ups and downs that he mentions in verse 12. In need, have plenty, well fed, hungry, living in plenty or in want. He's able to maintain a mature outlook regardless. When he has to do without, he doesn't grumble. When he's in plenty, he's not awkward or ashamed of that. He holds his possessions loosely. They're not the things he pins his satisfaction on, whether they're there or not. His satisfaction is in Jesus. So if they're not there, he's not devastated. Jesus is still with him. And if he has them, well, he accepts them gratefully and doesn't desperately hold on to them in case they disappear. Jesus is watching over him. I guess over the years, I think that I've seen that Christians generally have a harder time dealing with wealth than they do with living in need. On one hand, being in need makes us rely on God and we look to him daily and our prayers are earnest. But if we're doing okay financially, our sense of dependence upon God lessens a bit. We've got it a bit more at hand. We've got some money in the bank aside. We, we, we've got that buffer. We're, we're doing okay. And sometimes we look at wealthy Christians with a bit of distrust, distrust or maybe even envy. So, you know, we think, oh, they can't be very spiritual if they've got money. But our church has benefited from godly people who have acted generously with the wealth that God's entrusted them with. Through anonymous gifts or through their will, we've got money here uh, so the work can continue and grow. We've got buildings to, to meet in. People have been generous. And by your generous giving week by week, you've freed me up to full-time work in the gospel. You enable missionaries to stay on the field. You keep gospel work going in our local schools. You enable local churches in the Pacific and Southeast Asia to reach out to their communities through Operation Christmas Child. Now that's a healthy, joyful, generous use of the money that God has entrusted you with. But when it all comes down to it, Paul knew the secret of healthy approach to money. So he sort of gives us almost like two little mottos, two little uh, things to, to memorize, two little uh, catchphrases. The first one's in verse 13. He says, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. He doesn't say, I can do all this when I have the money. It's God who ultimately brings growth to a church, not the money spent on programs or things. Big churches with lots of money still need to rely on the Holy Spirit if anything of any eternal value is going to be done. And the second motto flows out of that. It's in verse 19. And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. He knows that God's in control and is going to provide all that we need to do the work. He knows your needs. He delights in meeting them. 
uh, once, once we have a made up mind about that, that that is true and that we settled in that, you can rest. It's not up to us to try and scrounge uh, for money or to uh, you know, look at the things that we're lacking. Instead, we look to the God who provides all our needs in, out of his glorious riches. So we can pray confidently and humbly, give us today our daily bread and know that you'll provide. So how do we find the joy of resting? It's when we have a made up mind to turn our worries to prayer. We have a made up mind to think on good things. And we have a made up mind to be content. And in that, we will know the peace of God. In all, after all our worry and stress, we can finally let our minds and souls relax. We know that God is in control. And when we're trusting him, he holds us in the palm of his hand. But in the busyness and the routines and the chores and everything that sort of makes a week flash by, sometimes we might need to go to Cram's Farm just to stop, to, to make our bodies and brains stop for a moment and rest and remember these things that are true. Maybe we need to take the weekends and days off and holidays that are available to us. And that might be especially true for those of us who are retired and yet find ourselves busier than we ever were. But then sometimes our minds won't stop and our hearts won't stop crying. Part of having a made up mind is having our minds saturated in the promises of scripture. So that's why, that's why for the next couple of months we'll be looking at some of those the weeping songs in the Psalms, those Psalms of lament, Psalms that help us express these things, how they can navigate, help us navigate the pain and find the peace of God that transcends all understanding. Yeah, it's not a magic cure. It's, uh, it's part of training our minds and our hearts to know and to believe and to act on these things. So hopefully these psalms of lament over the next couple of months might help us to be able to do that, to, to fit, fix our minds and hearts on the Lord Jesus and these great promises. But with these things in mind, let's come to God in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have given us uh, these wonderful uh, encouragements to come to you and find rest for our souls. The well, Lord Jesus gives us that invitation. And here we, we are given this big long list of all the things and ways that we can know that you are our loving Heavenly Father who cares for us and wants us to know peace. But uh, we, we hear these good things and sometimes there's something in our, our minds and hearts that resist it, like as if that's, that's just not going to work. These worries are too big. But train us in our thinking and in our heart language to be able to hold these truths close to our heart and to believe them and act on them. Lord, sometimes we have spent many years training our minds to worry or to look for the negative things, to be scared about what's out there. And so we pray that you might uh, graciously and patiently retrain us so that we're hearing these true words from you. Please grant us your peace and may our peace be a means of other people finding peace as well. Because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.